Life after death is a great promise to those who believe in Jesus. But what about those who have never heard about Jesus? And for everyone, why do innocent people suffer? And how can we comfort those, including ourselves, who suffer? Hi, I'm Yvonne Pran, and welcome to Bible 805, where you learn to know, trust, and apply the Bible. Those are the questions we're going to answer today in our lesson, Genesis and Job, Answers to the Big Questions of Life. And these questions that we're going to talk about today are, what about people who've never heard of Jesus? Why do innocent people suffer? How can we help people who are suffering? Here's where we are in week two of going through the Bible. We're still reading through Job, and in the previous lesson we established the truth that there's life after death. In addition, Jesus himself said that the only way to this life was through him, which brings us to the question number four, what about people who haven't heard about Jesus? If he's the only way to eternal life, the answer to this question is critically important. And it's also one that worries many and causes others to doubt the fairness of God. Now here's how the book of Job helps us with an answer. It's true that no one gets into heaven without acknowledging and trusting Jesus as Savior. But as for those who we assume, who we assume haven't heard, how do we know what God's revealed to them? Job reminds us that the Bible does not tell us the story of all humanity. Our Bible is primarily focused on telling us a narrow part of the human story, primarily that of a chosen people, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, whose history from the beginning of their start with Abraham leads to the birth of the Messiah, who is Jesus, and then continues with the church in the New Testament. The story of how God narrows his focus from all humanity to one group starts in Genesis, and we're going to talk about that in another lesson. But for now, what's important to understand about Job is that he isn't part of that particular story. He was not part of the chosen people. He was not a Jew or part of Abraham's line. Yet, he offered sacrifices, the correct sacrifices, and worshipped the one true God. He was called blameless by God. He lived his life to please God. Job spoke of God as his Redeemer. He believed in an afterlife. He believed in moral accountability in accord with the standards later revealed explicitly in Scripture. God personally intervened in his life and after his trials restored him. Though Job's friends made some incorrect accusations and conclusions, it is obvious all of them also believed in Jehovah God. But neither Job nor his friends were Jews. Nothing else of their story is told before or after this book. Now this isn't our only glimpse of God at work in unexpected places. We see many little pictures sort of scattered here and there in scripture if we look for them of God's saving involvement in the lives of those who were not part of quote unquote the chosen people. For example, the story of Jonah. We tend to focus on the fish, but this is really an important story. He was sent to preach to the Assyrians in Nineveh one of the most cruel pagan nations of the time. We know many in Nineveh repented in response to one of the shortest sermons ever preached with one of the worst attitudes, where Jonah simply went around the city shouting, 40 days from now and Nineveh will be destroyed. 40 days from now and Nineveh will be destroyed. Many people responded and came to know God. Then there was Rahab a woman of ill repute who is part of a nation that God said to destroy totally because of their idolatry. Yet she knew about God. She knew his power. She risked her life to hide the Jewish spies. And she becomes an ancestor of Jesus. And then there is Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, who They were enemies and oppressors of Israel. His household servant, a captured slave, persuaded him to go to Israel for healing, which he did, and in the process acknowledged a trust in the true God. 
In the New Testament and today, we have no idea what happened to the many thousands, as the book of Acts says, from every nation under heaven who heard the story of Jesus at Pentecost and then went home to share that message. We read the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, who the Apostle Philip found reading the book of Isaiah, and whose heart was open to the gospel, and who responded by being baptized and then returned to Ethiopia. Today we hear many stories of Jesus appearing in dreams to Muslims whose faith prepares them for visions, and stories from missionaries who go to isolated people who somehow know the story of Jesus. I imagine there are many more stories that we won't hear until we rejoice over them in heaven, but Job gives us a glimpse and assurance that God is involved in much we cannot see. In conclusion, our answer to the question of what about people who haven't heard about Jesus as the only way to eternal life? There's two parts to this. Most important, how do you know that those you have no contact with haven't heard? We don't know what God is at work doing, so trust God for them. But Now, this is important. For those people you do know, tell them about him. There are many ways, personally, through social media. You can invite them to a group. Bible 805, my website, it's got podcasts and videos about what it means to become a Christian. Please check out the story of the Bible. It's good news, the good news of salvation. It's on YouTube. It's on this podcast. Refer him to that. I did that podcast, that lesson specifically. If you have a friend that wants to know, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to get saved? How do I get saved? That will explain it to them. Christianity Explored is wonderful for a group experience, and I highly recommend it. And I'm sure your churches have many more resources, but we don't know about the people we're not responsible for. For those we know, we are responsible, and so please share the resources available to you. Now, the next questions follow the conclusion that everybody's included in God's plans, though perhaps in ways we can't see. And these questions are, why do innocent people suffer? And how can we help people who are suffering? Now, we're going to look at the book of Job and how it helps answer these questions. Question number six, why do innocent people suffer? First, we need to see if Job fits the description of an innocent person suffering. In chapter 1 of Job, God said Job was blameless. Looking at his life then tells us what God considers a blameless life to be. See chapters 23, 29, and 31 for the specifics on what made him blameless before God, but in summary, Job did these things. He treasured God's words. He helped the poor. He counseled others. He wept for those in need. He was sexually pure. He was just to the least. He did not trust in money. He did not rejoice over his enemy's misfortune. He did not conceal his sin. In summary, I think you could say that he put into practice Micah 6.8 in that he did justly, he loved mercy, and he walked humbly with his God. God's requirements don't change. Personal godliness and caring for the less fortunate are always important. These things define a blameless person. So Job certainly fit into the category of an innocent, suffering person as do many people who suffer today. Now, if Job did what God wanted, this is where it starts getting challenging. Why didn't God continue to bless him? According to Job's friends, obviously, Job quit obeying God, and so he was punished. Is that right? Now, we need to understand this. This is really important. So please follow my thinking on this, and I pray that it makes sense, because the idea that you need to do something and then God will automatically do something is what we hear today. It's often proof texted. That means pulling a verse out of context to prove something by verses in Job. But here's why this is a problem and why this teaching can be dangerous and why it is incorrect. Now bear with me again, not only for a better understanding of Job, but how this applies in your life. First, in the context of the book of Job, we know in Job 
that what he was suffering was instigated by Satan. God's told us that. So we know that the reason for some suffering is because of spiritual warfare we can't see. Yet we struggle to explain it in human terms. And here's where we see the recorded arguments from Job's friends. Now, I have sometimes ask, you know, why is all this there babbling in the Bible? What are we supposed to learn from it? Well, this might be, again, this might be a little bit complicated. But here is why I think that is. And this is so important. You need to read the book as a whole to really understand why his friends' arguments are in there. Because sometimes it isn't until the end of the book that all the pieces fit together. Job, even more than any others, is not one you can just pull verses out of context. This is especially true because Job is part of what's called wisdom literature. And when you read wisdom literature, you must read the whole book, the entire book, beginning to end, then you understand the arguments presented in it, and then the all-important conclusion at the end of the book. And here is God's conclusion at the end of the book. At the end of the book of Job, in Job 42, 7, it says, After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has. You must keep this in mind when you read the statements and arguments of Job's friends. Their statements sound so good, so sensible. But God's summary of their arguments is that they were not true. You must read their comments with this in mind. This is so important because the arguments from Job's friends are the same ones people use today when someone is suffering. But again, remember, God said they're false. Now, here is an example of one of them. But a large part of the book is taken up by ones very similar to this. Here's a typical statement from one of his friends. Submit to God and be at peace with Him. In this way prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove wickedness from your tent, you will pray to him and he will hear you and will fulfill all your vows. What you decide will be done and light will shine on your ways. We might want to say, oh yeah, yeah, you do this and then God will bless you. But God said that wasn't true. Now, What's wrong with it, we might say? Shouldn't we submit to God, be at peace with Him, return to Him? Yes, of course we should. That isn't the problem, but here is the problem. This is tricky. We don't like to hear this. This is confusing, but listen carefully. The problem is that by doing what we are supposed to do, humans, you and me, do not obligate God to respond in the way a human thinks God should. This view of suffering and reward is an incorrect transactional view of humanity's relationship with God. Let's examine it a little more carefully because without thinking this is how many people believe God acts today and it's wrong and it's ultimately disappointing. Job's friends believe God sinned and deserved to be punished. If he quit sinning, then everything would work out well. They believed evil is punished and good is rewarded by prosperity on a continuous basis in this life. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. God did not validate this belief then, and he doesn't today. This is prosperity gospel preaching. If you do this, God will do that. No, that is not what Job teaches. That is not what the rest of the Bible teaches. We do not obligate God to do anything for us because we obey him. He is our creator and God, and we owe him our obedience regardless of what he does for us. That is not a popular view. It wasn't then, or it isn't now, but it's true. You see, much more is always going on than we can see. We aren't guaranteed simple answers to the trials and troubles of life. 
Most certainly the answer as to why things happen is not sort of a baptized version of karma, which is really what this is, what Job's friend said. Not a transactional view of God, where we do certain things and God will respond in a certain way. God is not a genie under our control. Now, if we're honest, we don't like this. We scream, it isn't fair. We want to be in control. We want to control God by our actions. We want to think that if we do this, he's supposed to do that. But it simply doesn't work out that way. It didn't for Job, and it won't for us. Ultimately, we have no idea why there is the suffering in a particular situation that there is, although Job shows us there is much more going on. As part of that much more is that spiritual warfare is a reality. Ephesians 6 tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Somehow, we're part of it. Somehow, the troubles of this world are part of it, and as part of it, we know in our trials, we're being watched by God, and the angels and demons. I don't know exactly what that means, but the scriptures is clear that that is going on. What we do in our lives and trials matters, perhaps far more than we can imagine. And in this life, chances are we will know nothing about it. As you read in the end of Job, God never answered his questions. He never knew from an earthly view what happened in heaven that caused his trials. With this in mind, we go to our next question. How can we help people who are suffering, and ourselves included? Share with people what I previously talked about. One of the best things you can give a suffering friend is the truth that the Christian life is not a transactional exercise of be good and get goodies, be bad and get smacked. Share instead an eternal perspective that God is in control and will work out all things one day. Honestly, that may not always help in the moment, but it is a core truth of the Christian life. Don't be a miserable counselor or one that condemns or judges when people are going through troubles. We never know precisely why or what God is doing. The person suffering may be greatly honored by God with this trial. Or even if they're going through a time of discipline, let God do it. Don't pile on. Don't shoot the wounded. Follow Job's advice here. To the one in despair, kindness should come from his friend, even if he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have been treacherous as a seasonal stream. Be kind. Pray for others for strength and wisdom and trust in God. Remind them and yourself that just because God is in control, and again, (laughs) you're not going to like what I'm going to say, it does not mean it will get better in this life. Though ultimate healing and blessing are guaranteed, timing is not. We will be healed and blessed. Maybe on this earth, maybe not. It did get better for Job, and it got better for Joseph, which you'll be reading about in Genesis. But it didn't get better for Jeremiah, or for the Apostle Paul, or for the many unnamed heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. And it didn't get better for Jesus. It didn't get better for Moses from an earthly viewpoint. After 40 years of exile, after answering God's call to lead Israel out of Egypt, he spent 40 years babysitting a quarreling, unthankful, constantly complaining group of people. And then he doesn't get to go into the promised land because he loses his temper. I think God gave him the story of Job as a comfort in all of this. Now, Advice on what to do in the midst of troubles. Do not wait until anything. I know so often when we're in the midst of a bunch of trouble, we want to say, well, until this happens or until that happens, then whatever. For the pain to go away, for things to get better, for you to get more money, health, wealth, whatever. Don't wait before you express thanks. 
not for the circumstances. There's a lot of really horrible things that happen, but in all circumstances, make it a discipline. Affirm that you serve a good God. There's been many times in my life, and I've been through some really, really awful things, losing everything, you know, people that I love dying, severe health crises, financial troubles, all kinds of things. Um, And my life right now isn't isn't, uh, exactly a cakewalk either. But I have tried to, as a discipline, say, God, thank you. I don't like saying thank you. I don't feel like saying thank you. But you have commanded that I say thank you. And so I'm saying thank you. Now, sometimes we need to give up a sin. Sometimes we aren't aware of what's wrong until trials come. In Psalm 119.67, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. <laughs> Sometimes we kind of get a smack and we need to give up something, and that, that is a valid uh, reason for a difficulty in life, and, and we need to be thankful for that also. Um, another verse along the same line is in uh, 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, where it says, think, and this is a message translation, I just love how it puts it, think of your sufferings as a way, as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. Everything in the world is about to be wrapped up, so take nothing for granted. Stay wide awake in prayer. Most of all, love each other as if your life depended on it. Sometimes it takes a smack on the head to get us to pay attention to what is truly important, and trials can do that. Pray for wisdom on how to respond. Now look at the context of this verse where um, a lot of us read James 1.5 where it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask of God. But Again, let me read this verse in context. This really helped me a few years ago where it says, Consider it pure pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. We need wisdom in the midst of trials. So ask for it with these questions. Always ask, Lord, am I doing something wrong? What do you want me to change? What may I have missed in this situation, in making this decision, taking this course of action, whatever? A lot of times, and the older I get and the more I travel with the Lord, a lot of times if something goes wrong, I realize it's a time to sort of stop and say, you know, what am I missing? Uh, What else haven't I thought about? Maybe the Lord wants to redirect me a little bit. Sometimes I ask also, what are you protecting me from? Um, (laughs) From literally boyfriends to business opportunities, God always knows what's best. And what might seem like a trial, what might seem like a difficulty, might actually be a blessing if we just wait and ask. And then too, of course, study your Bible. Get a correct view of how God works, which you will only learn from reading the entire Bible and learning it well, which you're in the process of doing. Keep at it. Observe in the Bible as we go along how others lived in trying times. You'll see great stories coming up in Joseph's life, David's, and many other Old Testament characters. Study the whole Bible so you don't have false expectations, but true hope as you come to see God's long-term, eternal plans for his people. And two more suggestions. One, share what's going on in your life. Trials give you opportunities, and people will ask. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trials, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Often we learn the most from others who have suffered the most. Two, don't give up when hard times come. Don't confirm Satan's accusation that you only serve God when things are going well. Acknowledge that God is good, faithful, and in control 
even if it's difficult to see. You can shake your fist and scream at the heavens if you need to, that you believe and trust God, maybe through pain and tears, but let the hosts of heavens know. Sometimes, I'm, I'm saying this from my own experience, sometimes when things have been really, really hard, and I was terribly sad, just because I don't want Satan to win in that situation. I don't want him to be able to accuse God. I will literally shake my fist and look to the heavens and say, I believe you are a good God. Even though everything around me doesn't show it, even though I might be in pain and suffering or all sorts of things going on, I believe you are a good God. In closing, let's review what we learned from Job in answering the big questions of life. How did we get here? God created us and all there is. What messed things up? Humanity turned away from God, believing Satan rather than God. Who is Satan and what power does he have? He's a created being under God's control, but for now, he's causing a lot of pain and suffering and he's constantly accusing believers. Is there life after death? A resounding yes! It is clearly taught from Job and Genesis to Revelation. Please see the lesson, Life After Death, for more. What about people who haven't heard of Jesus? We don't know they haven't heard, but we do know God is at work in many ways we know nothing about. Why do innocent people suffer? Many reasons we don't understand, but we know all suffering is under God's control and no suffering will last forever. How can we help people who are suffering? Be kind, be honest, encourage them to develop an eternal view. A few concluding thoughts underscoring these key teachings. It is incredibly important for us, as it was for Moses, to understand these truths as we go through the Bible and life. Again, I think Moses really needed Job's story before he could serve for 40 plus years in the situation he did. We need them to live what is ahead of us. We live in tremendously difficult times, and chances are that ch many challenging trials are still ahead. God does not interact with us on a transactional basis of if we do this, he is guarante guaranteed to do what we want him to do. God will do as he chooses, even if it involves temporary suffering, and temporary might mean the rest of your earthly life. But remember, in light of eternity, what a tiny time that is. Spiritual warfare is a reality that is pervasive, unrelenting, and somehow involves us, though God is always in control. God's will for us and what happens to us goes far beyond this life. And His will and plans for us are good. We may not get a personal vision of God as Job did, but we see him in his word. And in his word, he promises, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Keep in mind the lessons of Job, the long view of trials, and be assured that at the end of it all, with joy complete, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's all for now. For notes from this lesson, related resources, and helpful links, go to www.bible805.com. In closing, I'm Yvonne Prynne, your fellow pilgrim, writer, and teacher for Jesus, and I'd like to end with this benediction. May you know the invitation of God to move from confusion to clarity, from wandering to rest, from loneliness to knowing you are love, from turmoil to peace, from wherever you are on your spiritual journey to a growing knowledge of God's Word and in your personal relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.